The sectors you normally associate with Latin America are the commodities, agricultural, mineral, and, uh, and energy. Those are the things that have been booming in recent years. But the, the, the area of the economy that's overlooked, it's just going to become very important, is, uh, is the consumer side of things because a whole new wave of Latin American consumers are, are emerging with the income to purchase cars and appliances and services. Cell phones is a big one, for example. That's what I'd look carefully at. I'd even look at consumer services and also financial services. I think they're going to be important. So that's sort of the ones that are uh, going to be are beginning to come in play and are in, going to be in play in the future. Let's assume you have the basic core business degree with the core courses, so you're competent uh, on the business side. What do you need to be competitive and effective on the Latin American side? Obviously, you need language, and one thinks immediately of Spanish, but Brazil's the big uh, player now in Latin America. It's about 40% of the gross regional product, so you need to know Portuguese as well. You need to know these two languages in a business sense to conduct business. So there's business courses, business terminology. Uh, then you need to know something about the culture. The cultures are Western cultures. They're not as exotic as uh, Asia or uh, the Middle East, but they're different. And um, so that you need to know those things. And that, those you can acquire here on campus at Purdue, but also by doing a summer program or uh, an internship in the region. Well, if you think about a student who wants to work in Latin America, for example, there are some barriers. You can't just go down there and work. You have to have a work visa in most countries. And a work visa usually depends on having a job. So typically those things are worked out with companies. Uh, if you want to do an internship, you also have to have a, a, the internship visa, a special visa. You can't just go there. And then going back to what I said earlier, you need to have the language and a sense of how to get along. And in Latin America, personal contacts are extremely important. So you need to, through friends and connections here at the university, connect up with their relatives and friends down there. So when you go there, you have letters of introduction uh, to people who can help you then uh, make the contacts within the business uh, arena that you want to make. Chile is a small country, it's about 15 million people. It sits at the end of the world on the, on the west coast of South America at the tip. Uh, so that's always been considered to be a kind of a disadvantage for Chile to be isolated like that. I think it's really been an advantage because Chile's been able to pull itself together came out of a uh, really tumultuous period in its history in the 1960s and 70s. Unfortunately, it was under a military dictatorship which violated human rights of Chileans. A lot of the stability was applied. But then the civilian government came to power in roughly 1990, has maintained the economic policies, the market-friendly, business-friendly economic policies of the, of the military regime, and they've embarked on a series of social programs to incorporate the whole society. So Chile has very strong institutions of government and politics, has strong political parties, it has a pretty responsive uh, judiciary, rule of law is pretty strong in Chile, rates of corruption are low, the economy is open, and it has commodities. The most important of these is copper. It's the world's leading producer of copper. Copper prices today are at, at historic highs. It also has uh, non-traditional uh, exports like wine we know in the United States, winter fruits and vegetables, lumber and uh, seafood products. So it has a kind of balance. The other balance to Chile is now it's spread out so it's it sort of trades with the United States, with Europe, with South America and now with the uh, Pacific Rim countries. So it has a series of free trade agreements with the Pacific Rim countries as well. Well drug violence is quite alarming in Mexico. It had been sort of uh, isolated or the, the business, the international business community had been kind of insulated from this until recently and now it's beginning to impact uh, international business. Along the border where a lot of the 
uh, U.S. companies and other foreign companies are located, the U.S.-Mexican border, and also in the industrial heart of Mexico in the northern city of Monterey. So people really are, are looking at carefully at Mexico because it is becoming a dangerous place and companies have to think seriously about that. I would say that thus far it hasn't had a major impact, but this coming year, this year that we're in now, is going to be a real test. The United States has uh, three important free trade agreements uh, in uh, force now. It has NAFTA with Mexico and Canada. It's been in, in operation since 1995. It has what's called the uh, DR CAPS, the Dominican Republic Central American Free Trade Agreement. That's been in operation for, I think, about four years now. And it has a free trade agreement with Peru, and that's been in operation about three years as well. Uh, on, uh, on the table awaiting congressional approval is a free trade agreement with uh, Colombia and a free trade agreement with Panama. And the President and uh, Congress have indicated they're going to move ahead on those, and, and that would be good. That, that would be a big step. The other thing I'd mention people don't think about is the number of Latin American companies are now coming into the United States. These are called multi-Latinas. They're like multinational firms, but they're from Latin America reaching out. And there are going to be job opportunities there as well as U.S. firms going in the other direction or foreign firms in general going to that region.